Good morning. My name is Oskald Melnichuk. Welcome to another episode of For the Record. Today's broadcast is co-sponsored by Writers for Democratic Action, Agni Magazine, Consequence Forum, Aerosmith Press, and the Shevchenko Scientific Society. This morning, our guests will help us think about how to talk about war. War is what happens when language fails, writes Margaret Atwood. What's more, once a war has started, language itself is one of its first casualties. It appears to lack the resources needed to convey war's unspeakable realities. But the unspeakable is precisely what we're going to try to talk about today. Those caught up in the madness and turmoil of war are confronted by a bewildering problem. Their house is on fire, and all inside it are shouting for help, while we, at some distance, struggle to make out what we're seeing and hearing. Today, we'll listen in on a conversation between two American writers with direct experience of witnessing and writing about war, and two Ukrainian writers and human rights workers involved in documenting war crimes committed during Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine. To help us see more clearly what often feels like a blur of images and information, we have with us Jackie Leiden, author of the internationally best-selling memoir, Daughter of the Queen of Sheba, widely hailed as a contemporary classic. Jackie Leiden was for over three decades an award-winning host on National Public Radio. She's reported on wars and conflicts in Syria, Afghanistan, Iran, Lebanon, Northern Ireland, and elsewhere. She's joined by Christopher Merrill, the award-winning author of over 20 books of poetry, essays, memoir, and translations, who also reported on the war in the Balkans. He is the director of the University of Iowa's celebrated international writing program, and in 2012, President Obama appointed him to the National Council on the Humanities. They are joined on the Ukrainian side by novelist, essayist, and human rights activist Victoria Amelina, author of, among other things, the award-winning novel Dom's Dream Kingdom, whose current project is The War and Justice Diary, Looking at Women, Looking at War, and by Roman Avramenko, the executive director of Truth Hounds. Roman has participated in more than 60 field monitoring missions to conflict zones in Ukraine and abroad. Welcome all. I thank you so much for being here with us. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris now. Thank you, Eskold. And uh, thank you, Victoria and Roman, for joining Jackie and me for this vital conversation. Uh, we stand in awe of the work that you have been doing during the six months of the Russian invasion and occupation of your country. And uh, it seemed, as Eskold has pointed out, a, a good moment to reflect on what uh, it is that you've been doing what Jackie and I uh, can recall of our experiences in war zone and see if we can't find some ways to think our way forward. I wanted to begin with a little quote by the great uh, Polish journalist and writer, Richard Kapuscinski, who covered something like 27 wars and coups and revolutions. And uh, he said something, this is back in the during the days of when I was covering the wars of succession in the former Yugoslavia, I always kept this in mind. He said, it is very difficult to write now because the end of our century is marked by a tremendous acceleration of the historical process. Literature hates this. He went on to suggest that the writer needs a certain quietness and evenness of perspective, a space of time for reflection. There is no distance now. There are some changes that we watch on the television, but there are certain very profound, important transformations which we do not have the opportunity to see. Fiction writers avoid this by writing about marriage, love, things like that. They will not touch the volcano that the world has become. If you try to touch it, to describe it, you find that it requires a new imagination. The problem is not so much with the writing itself as with the creative imagination. The acceleration of history proves that we have a very limited imaginary capacity. We never dreamed the world would become such a rich and various place. 
truly that's what we, I think, have experienced uh, watching you uh, witnessing the ongoing brutalities of the Russian war machine in Ukraine. And so we thought we'd use that as a starting point to uh, ask each of you, Victoria, then Roman, what it is you've been doing, what's on your minds as uh, the days and nights of this war unfolds. So, Victoria? Uh, thank you, Christopher. Uh, good day, everyone. Actually, uh, I could not agree more with the statement that language is perhaps one of the first casualties of the war. Uh, and uh, basically all writers uh, whom I uh, know were not able to read books or write books uh, in, in uh, the February, in March, or even in April. But uh, right now, some of us at least write essays. Uh, and I am actually on my journey writing uh, this uh, War and Justice uh, Diary. Uh, and uh, I, I actually try to write uh, because it seems uh, also important to uh, tell the world what's going on uh, in Ukraine, uh, to uh, tell the world not just about uh, the war itself, but uh, about Ukraine, because suddenly uh, the world noticed that uh, we do exist. I actually do agree that uh, a fiction writer does need some distance, uh, but there are different ways for us to create uh, such a distance. For instance, my debut novel was uh, on uh, um, the Dignity Revolution, the Euromaidan that happened uh, in Kyiv in 2014, and after which actually Russia first invaded Ukraine. Uh, and somehow I managed to find this distance by, by just uh, introducing the character, the main character who was just very different from me. Uh, he was uh, just an average Ukrainian man. So it was easier for me to create the distance uh, uh, via the character. And right now I'm writing a nonfiction book uh, and uh, on quite horrible things, but uh, I'm trying to find the distance uh, in a foreign language. I'm writing it not in Ukrainian, but in English, and this really helps. So some tips from me. Can you say a little more about how it helps to be using, let's say, the distancing language of English to write this account? It's just that uh, your native language holds all, all your emotions, I guess. Every word is uh, full of senses. And um, right now, every word in Ukrainian is pa painful. For instance, I would say park in Ukrainian, and I would instantly imagine a park uh, in Bucha, because I love that park and I used to go there. And now Bucha is a synonym of uh, Bucha massacre. Um, so uh, I say festival and I immediately remember our festival uh, in the Don Donetsk region, the, festi the New York festival, which uh, I organized and, for instance, uh, the festivals in Mariupol. Um, so every, every word uh, holds some piece of pain, at least uh, when you are a writer. Uh, but when you do the same uh, in a foreign language, then uh, perhaps... Uh, Perhaps it's easier. The language is more more like tabula rasa for you. It, it, the, every word does not hold all those senses. Wonderful, Roman. Can you tell us something about what you've been up to? Uh, sure. Hi, hi everyone. Basically, nothing really changed in in, in my life or in my work because. Before the invasion, I've been involved into the documentation of uh, war crimes and other international crimes for already almost eight years. I've been to the Donbass region numerous of times. I've been to the annex Crimea and other regions affected by the conflicts, for instance, uh, in 2020, when the hostilities outbursted in, uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh. I've been twice to the field mission to train local NGO representatives how to document and also participate in the, the collecting of the evidence of the war crimes. So on, 20, on February 24th, um, I woke up in a quite uh, safe place. We had really thought through all the possible uh, harms and uh, dangers that can we, we, we could expect 
in course of the full-scale Ru Russian invasion, we were fully prepared and well set up. So it uh, it took for us only five and, and, and a half hours to relaunch our work in a, in a full scale. We continue to monitor and document information of the alleged war crimes. We split the regions of Ukraine by between ourselves, uh, and, and then in late in in early April, when many Ukrainian settlements has been have been liberated by Ukrainian army, we relaunched our field documenting monitoring missions to these settlements, collecting witness testimonies, observing the crime scenes. It was, of course, uh, a bit surprising for me. Then I used to travel to the to Donetsk and Luhansk region as to the like field documentation trip and then coming back to uh, relatively safe Kyiv or to Chernihiv, my native town. And then it was quite surprising when I started to document in my native city of Chernihiv. I was walking the same streets I've been walking for, for many years, uh, but now I observed the destruction. The impact craters from the cluster submunition exploded on the street where I, I, I walked many times. And uh, I documented direct hit to the kindergarten when where I went and where my, my youngest daughter went. And I, I still remember, remember this smell of, of kindergarten food when I, when I was bringing my, my daughter to the kindergarten. And now it, it, it was destroyed and burned and the, the smell was totally different. It, so I, I would say I, I didn't expect at any time in my life I would document international crimes in my native city. But if you live in close to Russia, you would need to expect these kind of things to be happened. I'd just like to respond a little bit to what Chris read and what Victoria was saying about writers not being able to write for months. Um, on February the 24th, I was actually at a writer's colony and I couldn't imagine uh, a crazier place to be because I was so far from my previous life where I would have been one of the reporters, you know, on that scene. And I wrote an essay uh, about that sense of disori disorientation. And I remember the last line was something about, we are all Ukrainians today. It took a long time before I could start to work that day. But I also want to respond to the Kap Kapuczynski because I think that at least as a as an audio reporter, uh, and of course it's all speech, right? We're all making something from words. You need to frame the experience somehow and words <laughs> are the only thing we have. You know, they may they may not be very good, but, uh, you know, unless it's unless you're only pictures. Um, so. I have always looked for people who could translate that experience. I'm particularly thinking of of the Middle East and Afghanistan. I was also our first reporter uh, at the scene and on the air on um, September 11th and how dissociating that felt to me because I was an American and there was no language barrier. But getting back to books, I've always looked for writers, artists, uh, cultural people to help bridge that experience for an audience because one of the things that is different between journalism and what Victoria and Roman are doing, at least right now, is journalism has a deadline. You know, you've got to finish it in a few hours or by the evening or the next morning, and you have to tell that story. And so trying to get the world's attention when you know that world is is noisy uh, means you need a, a portal, a way in. Um, th and that is something that I've always looked for. And books have served as that bridge for a lot of the people to whom I've spoken. especially fiction. Um, maybe I could share with you a little excerpt from a library I visited in Baghdad at the university there, uh, which Chris has also been to. Uh, but this was just uh, about five months after the war had started. And I met this woman who introduced herself as the head librarian. 
she turned out not to be a librarian at all. She was in this ruined uh, creosote smoke uh, fill. The, you know, the, obviously uh, the act of smoke was no longer there, but it was still very hard. I have It was hard for me to breathe. And she was trying to restack the shelves. They had ransacked the Shakespeare, the Jane Austen. It was the, it was a, uh, the library it was de- devoted to arts and sciences. So there were a lot of English language novels there. I don't know the rules anymore, she said, and I can't stay home forever. I can tell you about this country. Only the powerful ones will survive. And I think the rest of us are doomed. I don't know who I'm working with. No one from before. So I talked to these books and they talked back to me. It was like a theatrical charade when I began. Everything like it was in another world. And I'm trying to wrest something, some order from this ancient ruined culture. People came from all over the Arab world to this library. My own father's work was here. It took me weeks to face what had happened and to come in here. Sometimes I used to sit here whole days just looking at the books and thinking about putting them back together. One day I started, just picked up a Shakespeare volume and started. Someday I will finish, but not too soon, I hope. And th- that always has resonated for me, you know, this uh, kind of what you're doing, Victoria, and you're doing in real time with these people. And so I'm so mightily impressed by your courage. And Roman, of course, you're getting the raw experience, the first draft, the uh, to compose into narratives also for an audience who isn't at the scene. Um, yes, I actually kind of right now uh, work for Roman as well. I'm uh, also documenting uh, war crimes uh, as a part of uh, his team. And at the same time, I'm I'm hoping to uh, write about uh, Roman himself and about his experience. As you can tell, even though with this episode with the uh, direct hit uh, to the kindergarten, you see it's, it's worth describing. And basically, this is one of the ways uh, how you uh how you can uh talk about those things because uh, you're not you're not uh, constructing your narrative uh, uh, just around the destruction but about what was there before uh because with ukraine we do have this problem in in the beginning of the war i think one of uh, uh, our uh, offices uh, made uh, uh, this uh, uh video where the war would start happening in paris and other places which uh, people know well and since they could recognize that this is paris this is uh, to uh, so everyone of course would start uh, empathizing with with these people uh, experiencing it uh, unfortunately ukraine remained invisible and uh, one of uh, our uh, most prominent writers Oksana zabushka actually pointed out that if you look in, at the map you will see a story for each and every country. Each each country has its story, but you don't have a story for Ukraine. It was just missing. Uh, I mean, we had it. We uh, knew all along that we are those fighting for freedom, uh, but no one no one joined joined us in our fight, and and uh, no one kind of believed us uh, uh, about what was happening between Russia and Ukraine uh, all this time. Although Roman and his team. Uh, was working, for instance, since 2014 to to have uh, secure evidence of uh, international conflict of of actually invasion, Russian invasion since 2014. So yes, it is very important uh, for us to uh, also um, ground our, ourselves in what was uh, here in Ukraine before uh, the invasion on February 24th. So, uh, for example. As I said, it is important to understand that last summer uh, in Bucha, there was international music festival. This was Bucha. So it's not like some place where those uh, deaths and destructions were all alone. Uh, No, we we had the international music festival in Bucha. We had literature festival in Mariupol and I'm sure many others. It's just I'm, I'm a writer, so I used to go to literature festivals there and so on and so forth. So it's very important, I think, uh, when talking about war to start not from February 24th and not even from uh, tw- uh, the year 2014, but to start uh, from from the beginning. 
sometimes uh, you see in Kharkiv, the history is uh, uh, has been tragic all along. So, for instance, I stayed for a week at the literary residence in Kharkiv, and it is located uh, in the apartment building where the most prominent writers, uh, Ukrainian writers, uh, used to live in 1930s. And then it became a, a tragic place. Um, of what we call executed uh, rena renaissance uh, because all the, almost all those writers were executed uh, one way or, or another by the Soviet Russian regime. Uh, but still they created beautiful art. So right now we turned this place, uh, one of uh, the apartments in this building into a literary residence. And we used to have a vibrant, vibrant community around this uh, literary residence. We have a wonderful literature museum in Kharkiv. Uh, but right now, you see, I'm writing about the, the, the uh, director of this Kharkiv Literature Museum, Tatiana Pilipchuk, because she as well has to help documenting uh, war crimes. She stays there because she has to stay. She, she, is, she has a museum to look after. So she helps uh, to find uh, witnesses, uh, to organize logistics for uh, teams like truth hounds uh, and uh, just general prosecutor's office, etc., etc., for all those people and journalists who want to look at the destruction of, uh, of uh, cultural heritage uh, in the Kharkiv region. For example, other museum was not that lucky, and I'm sure you've heard that uh, uh, the museum of uh, wonderful Ukrainian philosopher Skovoroda was destroyed with uh, uh, direct heat. I'm sure uh, Roman knows more details on what what missile it was, etc. But it's pretty obvious, uh, for, even for me, that uh, uh, it's a clear war crime because uh, this museum is surrounded by wonderful park. Uh, so there is nothing else there but this uh, old 18th century building where uh, actually Ukrainian philosopher spent his last days. So it's a historical building and it's now gone. Uh, I, I can tell for sure now yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Victoria, about what particular missile or shell was used to target the museum. But I can totally agree with you that the cult cultural uh, objects became... Uh, surprisingly, the primary primary targets for Russian artillery and uh, air forces, and also missile launches. We've been also to Kiev region, to Ivan Kiev, <clears throat> to museum where many painting paintings of the also famous Ukrainian uh, painter. Oh gosh, Maria Primachenko. Right, Maria Primachenko were kept. So the this sole small museum was hit directly several times. It got uh, several direct hits and people uh, were evacuating the paintings from the Berlin Museum. I've been to Chernihiv region. I've documented attacks on the place where I had lived and raised uh, another uh, prominent Ukrainian uh, poet and, and, and right, it was in in, in Piki, Chernihiv region. Uh, so it's it's so sur surprising you know, uh, Russians trying to to target the cultural heritage of Ukraine, and especially one um, one incident struck me at the same settlement that there were a monument erected to memorize the victims of the German Nazis who killed and burned alive 300 people into in, in the church and they killed another 500 uh, citizens of the village back in 2000 uh, in, in 1942 uh, because they were supported the resistance groups uh, operating there in in, in in a thick forest of Chernihiv region and at the place where this church uh, has been burned uh, people erected a monument with the names of, of all deceased and when Russians come this March, they just bombed this monument with their armored vehicle and demolished that just of because of no sense. So they, they, they have come to like save Ukrainians from, from Nazis to make this denazification. And at the same time, they demolished the monument to memorize the victims of the German Nazis, which was like so, 
obvious that the, 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 the true aim of Russians was entirely not a, a, any kind of massification. Well, it, it's to erase a people and their memory. And one of the quickest ways to do that is through the cultural institutions and cultural artifacts. I'm just thinking back in the wars of succession in the former Yugoslavia, speaking with an American literature professor in Sarajevo, and we were talking about the destruction of the National Library there, as well as the Oriental Institute, just uh, priceless collections of texts and manuscripts, illuminated manuscripts and books all going up in ash. And uh, my friend Zvanko Radelkovic said to me, yes, but remember that the people who orchestrated the destruction of the National Library, one was a poet, Radovan Karatic, the Bosnian Serb war criminal, and, and another was a professor of English literature, Nikola Kolyevich, who not long before the beginning of the siege of Sarajevo, uh, gave a speech from the balcony of the National Library against capital punishment. So what a rapid change of, of, of events that he would now be instrumental in the destruction of this place of memory. But the other thing that, came, that I've been thinking about as we've been talking here, on my first reporting trip to Sarajevo, I had a conversation with the, the legendary New York Times reporter, John Burns, who said uh, two things to me that have stayed with me ever since. He said, this story, and he, he waved his finger around the, pointing to the, the, the Serbian guns who occupied all the high ground around Sarajevo. He said, this story writes itself. And I, I could understand that. And, and then he said that the New York Times had recently done a survey of its readers uh, Burns's pieces were almost always on the front page, often above the fold. We imagine that the New York Times readers are the most sophisticated uh, readers in America, the, the real no news hounds. And what John, uh, what the Times discovered was that only about 19% of the Times readers were actually reading the, his articles coming out of Bosnia. And uh, they were articles that, among other things, would win him a Pulitzer Prize. But there's a way in which the general population doesn't want to have too much knowledge about things like uh, Sarajevo, where only eight years before the siege began, they were hosting a, a brilliantly successful Winter Olympics, uh, or Bucha, where there was a music festival, and there's a, a kindergartens, and there's all the stuff of life. At a certain point, the, the human mind and imagination begins to just to shut it down because it's too much to take in. And so that that makes me wonder what 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 the writer can do to try to counteract that, to try to co not only collect the evidence, but to frame it in such a way that people will care and will continue to care. Can I just one point about that is that he, even here in the U.S., we have targeted cultural symbols. I'm thinking when you were speaking about Busha, uh, and the museum where the uh, victims of the Germans were executed a second time, if you will, you know, the second execution of a of a re re renaissance. Uh, we've erased a lot of indigenous people here and a lot of their symbols and a lot of their um, history and, and even uh, very ancient ones. And I think that what people do sense and our challenge as writers is that there is an evil out there and how much of a given day can they absorb it and i don't think we all we can do is our best and i think that there will be and there will be a generation uh more looking at the work that Victoria and Roman are doing and, and so many others are doing now because if there's one thing I've learned over a long career it's that war doesn't end and the victims of uh, an atrocity or uh, my own translator was killed by an American soldier uh, I've had a close and intimate view of what happened to his family what happened to his parents his brother uh, his daughter uh, his wife eventually remarried another translator who went to work for the U.S. Army. I mean, stories that you almost can't, uh, a fiction writer might not be believed if they had written that story. Uh, the new husband, who was also a friend, although not, uh, he'd been one of NPR's translator. I met him because he was in that classroom 
um, studying Bertolt Brecht uh, after the war. And now he's an intelligence officer with, uh, with NORAD and CENTCOM. So, you know, people have to channel and we have to help them do that. We have to help them cut grooves in the ennui of of daily life, which isn't particularly, I think, easy uh, here. But of course, it is not like seeing your children destroyed at kindergarten or your pregnant mothers targeted. Or the there is, I will say, the unbelievable heinousness of this has certainly gotten. Uh, attention. I was just recently visiting a friend in northern Wisconsin, and there is a Ukrainian candle. There's a candle company. They're making these yellow and blue Ukrainian candles, and they've raised a million dollars uh, selling these these things. And so people, that's the other thing. You have to give people tools by which they feel they can do something. Maybe it's only money, but maybe it's some other type of witness. Um, and that's we're all part of the story. Is it important to let people feel that? Uh, yes, thank you so much. I, I could not agree more. And actually, I do think uh, uh, that it is important during a war not uh, to show uh, people only in grief and despair, because this is not the reality. I mean, every uh, maybe every war correspondent is trying to find this, you know, the most horrible uh, story. But at the same time, uh, uh, you know, we here in Ukraine, even, though, even those those who fight and stay in the trenches or those who document horrible war crimes, uh, even those, I mean, I've been uh, uh, working uh, uh, for one day with the book who is trying to identify the rest of the bodies in Bucha. And even they sometimes laugh because this is human nature, because this is how we, we can survive through it all. Uh, so it, it it is important to show that we are humans and we are not you know crying constantly. Uh, recently, uh, you know, when we had this uh, wonderful I think exhibit of uh, uh, destroyed Russian tanks uh, on the uh, main square of Kiev. Just to cheer you up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <attend> this <laughs> yeah, that was the idea, and actually I saw a lot of of people who were really happy i mean i i, I felt I, I felt no alone no, uh, anymore because uh, there were many ukrainians and some foreign uh, journalists but mostly ukrainians families walking around those tanks uh, uh, children were climbing those uh, tanks although there were of course stable uh, tables saying uh, do not uh, climb because it could be dangerous but still everyone climbed them uh, and uh, took pictures so uh, it, and it, and it felt good. And then when I actually reached, uh, I was walking uh, down uh, the Hushetic Street, and then I reached Maidan Nazalezhnosti, and people were singing and dancing there. Just I, as far as I understand, somehow spontaneously, someone uh, had musical instruments, and people be, be, began uh, dancing together. Uh, and I filmed a little bit of it, and it was a very popular tweet, and uh, among you know people uh, in the West, because as far as I understand. You there also want to see us that we are uh, that we have some. Uh, of course, the war is going on and horrible things continue happening. But at the same time, uh, there is some result. And in Kiev, people can can dance sometimes and then go back to work. Maybe go back to the front line or document war crimes or whatever. But but we we also have lives, and this is important. The other thing is that I don't think that when you have empathy and when you really uh, want to help Ukraine that you have to, you know, scroll the news uh, the whole day. This this doesn't help. You do not have to absorb all this pain because there's too much pain. You cannot absor absorb it and uh, even survive. So you just, uh, uh, I would advocate for just putting Ukraine into your schedules. Like I will donate to Ukraine regularly. I will follow the news regularly, but like check in, I don't know, once a day, but not all the time, etc., etc. And this way you can, because this is a long fight, this will not, you know, I, I don't think that uh, uh, this will end soon because just because uh, Russia has, uh, as we, we have a joke that the Russian army is not good, but it's very long. So, uh, that's why that's why we we need to stay uh we need you to stay with us and we need you to stay sane 
So, uh, so you don't have to absorb all the pain uh, that we're experiencing here. But please just put 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 us in in your schedules uh, and, and stay with us for, for till our victory. Actually, you know, Victoria, that that joke is just reminds me that I, I never heard more jokes than when I was in Sarajevo during the siege, uh, because right. that's one of the ways that people keep their their wits about them and and what it also reminds me of is that uh, war wars tend to bring out not only the worst in people but also the best and uh, people invent new ways of being in the world and the the American literature professor I uh, mentioned you know, what one of the things he did during the siege was a new private radio station was created in Sarajevo called Radio Z, Radio Wall. And uh, the man who uh, uh, was running it asked Zvanko if he wanted to have a show. And Zvanko loved country Western music. And so he, he invented a show called Sarajevo Country Club. Because as he liked to say, country music knows no ethnicity, at least in Bosnia. It doesn't care if you're a, a Muslim a, a Serb, a Croat, it's just music. And he always ended the show. It was one, he did it one once a, a week and he never missed a show uh, by saying, don't give up hope. That's what they, and by they, he meant the Serbs ringing the city. That's what they want you to do. So part of, part of what I think writers can do in such circumstances is to seek out those stories that are a little bit to the side that, that are as much about the daily life, the quotidian, as they are about the ways in which people adapt to these new and horrible circumstances in sometimes amazingly creative ways. Can I just jump on that? Um, down the road, one of the most meaningful things that I did, and actually um, I was still, I had taken some time off work, but I was still you know, employed as a reporter, but I asked for some time off and I taught uh, Afghans to document their own lives. Uh, a friend of mine started a very popular, um, massively popular program here called This American Life. So I called the, my uh, program in Afghanistan, uh, This Afghanistan, Your Afghan, My Afghanistan Life. And uh, we were, I was uh, with an NGO called Internews for a couple of months when I did this. And so each student, and I had 12, and they ranged in age from 16 to 55. I, I taught them how to ask questions of their lives, how to interview their friends and themselves, how to uh, sort through memories. But they got stories that as a Western journalist, I could never, ever have gotten. And I was telling Chris, who I've known for a long time the other day, about one young man who had been 18 uh, when the Taliban was in power in Herat, had been forced to partake in a stoning. The entire town had to partake in the stoning of this woman accused of adultery. She survived, the lover survived, the husband survived, the mother survived. We sent him back to interview all those people. And they were all amazingly willing to speak. So th that's what I'm saying. War isn't going to, this isn't going to end even when that very long army is in your rear view mirror, as we like to say. And I do love hearing these, this gallows humor, because I think it just helps us keep our sanity when we're looking at things that you can barely put into a report because they're so unspeakable, you know. And of course, you don't describe this, the horrible smells of the dead and all of the, and the blood splashing up the walls and things that occasionally, you know, just I'll be driving and still drift through my mind. But thinking of my life as Afghanistan, uh, we broadcast that. That was empowering to them. Those stories of their survival through the war and beyond. And now they will have, and now it must be done all again. I mean, one of the, some of the most despairing people I'm talking to now are people who've had to leave Afghanistan who thought they had, you know, a future there. So the ways that we encapsule, is that the word? The ways that we percolate these stories, frame them, stitch them together, give them life. You know, it's a little bit like Frankenstein maybe, but um, we have to do it. If you're a writer, you have to do it. If you're a documentarian, you have to do it. And if you're a humanitarian, you have to look at, it, you know, and we have to teach all people to be humanitarians. 
I know that sounds kind of preachy, but I think it's it's accurate. I would also jump in and add that, of course, uh, in Ukraine, the situation is uh, um, almost unprecedented because uh, it's, uh, I think, for the first time in a while when uh, absolutely an independent uh, state was attacked uh, uh, by a, a state which is so so much bigger and with so much longer army, etc. Uh, so, and in this case, we do have a situation where uh, on uh, the victory of Ukraine Ukraine would mean something to the world and the defeat would be just a disaster basically because it's a fight between uh, democracy and autocracy and this is what we didn't have uh, I think and I'm afraid in Afghanistan or Yugoslavia there was uh, there was a bit different and right now we are finally back to the situation where there is black and white and by the way, it's not very convenient for for good literature because in good literature, you you know, you should you should portray like uh, there there uh, there are many shades, uh, and uh, war is just inherent inherently uh, bad, whatever. But it's not the case here. Uh, here, it's absolutely different, and the best choice one can make is actually uh, join the army, and uh, and this is a black and white situation. Uh, and it's so new even for us because we also, you know, uh, used to all the, those uh, postmodern uh, novels uh, where this uh, this seemed absolutely impossible uh, to say that there's evil and there, there's good and we just have to side with the good. So it's it's very new, I think. And I think because of this black and white situation, Zelensky is doing so great job because he's not a good actor. <laughs> uh, that's why everyone just adores him and, and, and fond of him because it's, it's easy to be a hero in this situation because it's clearly clear distinguish between good and bad between black and and, and white and when you uh, head in the army of uh, of of light and you defeat in the darkness you be as a as a bad actor <laughs> It, 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 it's, I think, the the best role of of Vladimir Zelensky in, in his whole life, and he would never thought maybe that uh, becoming a president he would uh, ever play this crucial and most important role in his life. And life has played this this jo joke with him. And it's a good thing he has a sense of humor, so that he would know what to quip at appropriate moments like i don't need a ride i need more ammo um, I, I wonder if uh victoria and roman if you could speak a little bit about uh two things on our on our minds one the presence or lack thereof of the un in this conflict i know that today uh the inspectors from the iaea are on the way out to the nuclear power plant to see what how disastrous the situation is but we're interested in, in, in what you think the UN's role should be in this in this war, and and you have we know we you documented I think Victoria you said something like thirty thousand war crimes now. Uh, what hopes you have for uh, all these war criminals uh, all finding justice if there will be an accounting, uh, and what that accounting might look like. Yeah, I, I think that generally yeah, Roman uh, will answer the, about the UN, and I would just uh, like to comment that 30,000 uh, uh, is what uh, uh, General Prosecutor's Office uh, reports now. So uh, different uh, NGO teams uh, also independently document different uh, number of war crimes. So 30,000 is General Prosecutor's Office number. Roman, would you please? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a sad story to 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 speak about the UN. UN has proven it's uh, total not not incompetent incompetence but inability to react in any way, but to just maybe proclaim some some statements, which will lead to nothing. And the the whole structure that has been established after the World War Two to and the with whole UN thing that has been uh, established to prevent war from being unfolded in future, they totally failed. And 
no one looks at the direction of the UN anymore, especially in Ukraine. We we, we can't rely on, on on this institution. We can't we can't expect any of the peace builders to be sent by the UN. We can't uh, expect any kind of influence that UN can 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 apply to to Russia to to stop this war. Everyone remembers how uh, when Antonio Antonio Guterres has visited Kiev for the first time during this uh, full scale invasion. Russia has launched a missile strike on Kyiv while he were he, while he was in the city just to to show how like how 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 little they they care about the the UN and the the secretary general of of, of the UN being presented in the in the city so they just launched this this attack And uh, I think this is just uh, what I was talking about, was saying uh, that this war is not just uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine, but this is a war between uh, democracy and autocracy, and this is a, a war for rule of law, although the war itself actually destroys rule of law. What we are fighting for is rule of law. This is why it is important that... Uh, uh, we document all the war crimes because even if we win and afterwards uh, we cannot restore justice, when we cannot prove anything, we cannot uh, at least do our best to find and punish all the perpetrators, then uh, we still lost. Of course, it's important to get back territory to save people's lives, but it, it is also important for us to restore the rule of law and uh, to have, uh, you know, all the Europeans to, to believe uh, in the rule of law and have uh, international institutions that really help us to, uh, you know, live uh, peacefully, because this was uh, our dream from the start, right? We uh, this is the, the very reason uh, why uh, Russia is attacking us, because we want to have uh, democracy and rule of law, not because we would like to join NATO, but because we chose democracy and this doesn't work for them. And of course, because we chose not to be not to be Russians. Mm, so this is this is very important, I think, what Roman is saying. Uh, I was just maybe <clears throat> add. Uh, that it's not only war be between good and bad people, it's, it's a war between different universes and you can't approach to Russia with the same legal tools, for instance, like, all right, we've documented this uh, horrible war crime and you, you have to react somehow. No one will ever react. Uh, we haven't seen any single situation when higher commander of Russian army has reacted at the atrocities, at the clear, brutal violation of the international humanitarian law being perpetrated by the soldiers. The only reaction we can expect is they put medals on their chests for doing this, for, commi for, for committing this. And all this talks about the accountability and punishment and, and, and rule of law, it just stops where the territory control by, by Russians starts. And you, you can't overcome this wall. And the only way now to prevent the war crime from being committed is, 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 is not putting someone behind the bars. We will, we already saw and we will see many trials when Russian soldiers will be put on the, behind the bars for, for 15 years, for, for, for life term even. But this won't prevent other Russian soldiers from, from committing war crimes. They just absolutely doesn't care about themselves and especially they doesn't that they don't care about Ukrainians as well. So the only way is for war crimes to prevent war crimes from, from being committed in future is to literally knock out weapon of the hands of Russian soldier. And then we will reach the situation where there will be no more war crimes. That's that's why me and, and, and my colleagues we we sometimes really feel feel miserable for continuing doing documentation and traveling to the to the conflict affected areas and so on. We feel that we should really join the army and and bullets to the direction of, of Russian troops because it's the only way. At the same time, uh, many people try to join us uh, to join our team because they feel the same while being on a in, on a on a different. In different places, on on, on a di different work, so they would abandon their work and join Truth Hounds to do something, to do more, to to help Ukraine uh, win this war. 
and at the same time we sometimes feel desperate like feeling miserable for doing this thing sometimes it's 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 not a method to, to prevent these horrible things to 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 happen roman i'm really glad you talked about the personal um tests the personal stress and uh trauma that you experience in doing your work because if you can't talk about that then i would really worry that you would not be able to sustain it um and i was really struck yesterday um uh, earlier this week uh victoria was speaking to penn and she uh was you are documenting all of these people who have joined the fight you know journalists and lawyers and uh other people and i remember and the un was impotent in iraq too i mean sergio uh, vera de mello was 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 blown up uh in august of 2003 with, with the truck bombs but my own uh again so we had a number of iraqis including my friend who i spoke about a little earlier who decided that uh, they would become truth tellers, that they would become journalists. And my friend had been a doctor. I met him my very first night, that journey to, to Baghdad. He he was, was unable to save a woman who uh, had been burned. And I felt guilty that he was going to leave medicine because clearly he was needed as a doctor, but he became one of the only Iraqis uh, re directly reporting for an American press entity. It was... Um, uh scripts um and anyway and later he and then he was the very one who was killed by an american soldier who's who i you know so yasser had like this horrible trajectory of the war invasion resistance uh helping committing to something new and ultimately losing his life but it is not it has not been a life that's been forgotten in the sense that um, through what we did, the um, Army War College and the Center for Lessons Learned and Harvard School of Human Rights all took that story, have used it in their curriculum. In fact, David Petraeus used that story when they released the civilian version of um, about counterinsurgency. So I guess it's a juggling act, you know, the days where you feel almost overcome and the days where you feel, well, at least I've extracted these truths. So I really just applaud that you that you do this juggling uh, and continue. Yeah, people make different choices here. And uh, we've seen a lot of people to turn to uh, journalism uh, since uh, 2015 to, docu to document war crimes or actually just being journalists, for example, in the occupied Crimea. Uh, and on uh, on one hand, I know uh, those uh, journalists who are now political prisoners in Russia because they uh, documented uh, uh, those uh, uh, crimes that Russia committed uh, at the occupied territory. At the same time, I know that uh, Truth Hounds and uh, Roman's colleagues and Roman came uh, went to document uh, those uh, crimes uh, uh, in, uh, that was happening in Crimea and to, to those very journalists. Uh, but at this time, I also know human rights defenders, lawyers, uh, and uh, war crimes documenters who just uh, joined the army, and we all can understand them. As Roman said, every one of us would like to just uh, uh, go and fight. Uh, at the same time, uh, I know, for example, a security uh, information security expert from Kharkiv uh, uh, who stayed in Kharkiv for all those days, and uh, uh, she decided to become a, jour a journalist, so she's now just uh, making videos and posting them uh, on Twitter, and she was covering uh, Kharkiv in uh, March, where uh, when there were not so many journalists ready to go to the uh, most dangerous places. So people also do make this choice of becoming uh, journalists uh, right now as well. It's just that every one of us is trying to find uh, a role in which uh, we would be the most uh, helpful and uh, would contribute to the victory in the best way. It, it occurs to me that uh, to go back to Victoria's notion about uh, 
things being black and white. Probably not since the Second World War has the world faced such a civilizational event, uh, an event that has the capacity to change the course of civilization. And remembering that two of the five permanent members of the Security Council, Russia and China, are authoritarian nations that that, remi that reminds us what the limits may be from that international institution. Um, but I take heart from the just the sheer number of citizen journalists uh, Victoria and Roman have have trained over this war. The, the the development of this cadre of people going out and documenting uh, war crimes. If nothing else, uh, they are they, they will be able to name and shame those who may end up being beyond the reach of the law, but who will forever walk this earth as uh, as, as criminals, as war criminals. And uh, uh, I, I, the, the final thing I want to say is, is there anything that we've missed that we should, uh, that, from Victoria and Roman, that, that you think uh, listeners should be knowing about here at this six month moment in the, in the war? Um, I think that, well, not only thing, but I know that this war uh, is the most documented conflict in the world because it's all happening online. And the the seconds after something happened, there will be in, in information in the internet. When I was driving here to Oslo, I was passing by. Um, I was passing by Ukrainian town that was hit uh, two times by Ukrainian mis uh, by Russian missiles. It was uh, Sarney. Where I was passing by Sarney, I, I stopped in the forest to to clear the the windshield because it did uh, be, be before the dark, and I heard two powerful explosions, and I started just checking the Telegram channels and uh, asked my colleagues. And in two minutes, there will already be published information about what has been struck. What destruction? So there, there were reports both from both Ukrainian and Russian side. So Ukrainian reported the that four civilians uh, were killed in, in that attack, and uh, Russian claimed they have hit the repairment the repair facilities in the outskirts of of the town. So the smoke from explosions was just started to up into the skies, and the the information about the strike was everywhere in the internet already. So for those who do want to know what's happening, there are plenty of chances to do that. Of course, I, I'm not saying that everyone should only scroll the, the news and uh, being fully involved in, in, into this. Uh, if any one of the, of the listeners of the podcast is, is interested in, uh, they, of course, can, can, can join a, a, any Telegram channel and, a, a, and see as fast as, as, as they want to. If they want some analysis, uh, analysis and the re, like results of the, of the investigation, they can always refer to, to our website because we have we are publishing the investigations just, just yesterday. Uh, the, day, the day before yesterday, we have published a report about missile strike on Mykolaiv back in uh, March. On March 29th, the mm, Russian vessel Admiral Essen has launched a cruise missile that hit the premises of the administrative building of Mykolaiv, killing 37 people there. So we have been there, we've visited the place, we have made the, we have reconstructed the whole attack the the trajectory of the missile we have talked to to witnesses and we have painted the whole picture of this and uh, another one war crime and, and you have that both in ukrainian and in english right right yeah you know you talked roman about uh, maybe what happens when they go home is just more medals on their chest i think for all of us to to remember whatever part of this work we're doing is that, uh, and Chris talked about it a moment ago, is that shame also continues and sometimes comes after uh, the heat of, of conflict. And I'm thinking of the man who, who fired the gun, who killed my friend, 
And uh, we tracked him down. We tracked the soldier down. And I've always thought that two people's lives were taken that day because although he did not materially, he did, he did go to, um, to prison in, within the military, although it wasn't for that. But when he was released, his life was never the same. And I can't believe that the lives of some of these uh, Russians will be the same either. I think that they're, the Ukrainian people uh, have the high ground and we will, we will help to make sure that you are heard and always have it. Yeah. Sorry, I need to take off now because uh, I, I will present the the Mariupol is two uh, documentary being presented here in Oslo at the film festival, and I will be speaking before the before the film starts with the audience. So it was a pleasure to to talk to you and see you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Roman. Thank you so much, Roman. Thank you so much, Roman. Uh, and I will just tell you that I have uh, wonderful uh, plans for this weekend. This uh, Saturday, I plan to go to one of the villages which was just recently occupied uh, by Russians, but now it's uh, liberated. Uh, so, of course, I will uh, uh, encounter a lot of uh, horrible uh, things there and uh, witnesses will be uh, telling uh, stories of uh, unspeakable uh, but still, this is good that uh, we are finally able uh, to enter some of the uh, villages in the Kherson region. And uh, uh, we uh, we are sure that uh, we can win. At the same time, I would like international law to uh, not only defend those who win, right, but just to be on the right side of history anyway. Uh, at the same time, we do do have uh, to win, uh, and in order to stop uh, war crimes happening on all the occupied territories, including Donetsk, Lugansk, and Crimea, and uh, uh, there, war crimes have been happening for uh, for years now. Uh, so finally, we have a chance to stop the suffering, and just uh, it's impossible un until it's done. And uh, please keep supporting Ukraine. Please uh, keep sending us weapons. This is what we need, and this is what writers, journalists, human rights defenders, lawyers uh, are asking from uh, Ukraine. We do need weapons. We do need uh, sanctions. Uh, um, and with this, uh, we will be able to win and stop all those war crimes from, from happening because we cannot document any more of them um, already too much. So we have to just stop it. Um, my heart with yours, Victoria. Slava Ukraine. Hello, um, Slava. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so very much. Um, Victoria, Roman, Jackie, and Chris, um, to um, our Ukrainian friends, we wish you victory. We wish you safety. To my American friends, thank you so much for engaging in this difficult question, for being here with us. Um, we're all grateful to you. Stay safe, everyone.